the poetry. I would like to just very briefly um, talk about the field of women in the Holocaust um, as a, a, a scholarly field that has really, it really began to emerge in the 1980s. Uh, which Joan Riegenheim and Esther Katz and Sybil Milton and others in specifically at an important academic conference that happened um, at Stern College in New York City in 1983. And it was this first conference in 1983 that really sought to add knowledge about Holocaust history as it related to the experiences of women, of women's history. And in order for, for them at that time to learn about how women responded to their circumstances during the Holocaust. And then a few years later in 1993 is when Holocaust scholars, uh, well-established and respected scholars, John Roth and Carol Rittner edited a volume for the first time that was titled Different Voices, uh, where they focused exclusively on women's voices and their experiences before, during and after the Holocaust, as well as their reflections on their experiences. And up until that moment in the early 1990s, most historical, social, political, philosophical, religious scholarship treated the Holocaust as if sexual and gender differences did not make a difference in people's experiences. But as we have seen in the past 30 years, through the scholarship of Holocaust scholars like Rochelle Seidel, Myrna Goldenberg, Amy Shapiro, Elizabeth Baer, um, Sonia Hedgepath, and many others uh, who are engaged in this scholarship dealing specifically with women's experiences during the Holocaust, uh, we are now able to answer some fundamental questions regarding their specific um, experiences. And it was the fall of 2019 uh, when a young female student walked into my office at the Ackerman Center and I had never seen her before, but she came in and she asked me this question, this very question, how did women survive the Holocaust? And it was from that initial conversation with this young student that I developed an independent study for her. And then in the fall of 2020, I taught the first organized course on women in the Holocaust for the School of Arts and Humanities at UTD. And it was in this class that Jane Sagana created um, this powerful collection, which uh, we have the wonderful opportunity to hear today. And so today we will be listening to five of the poems from Jane's collection, uh, which uh, are inspired by the women that we studied in that class. And, you know, anytime we approach a creative project such as this one, there is always uh, the question about, you know, writing creative uh, literary, literary pieces inspired by real life experiences. And so before we get into the reading, I just wanted to um, ask Jane to speak for a moment about this question that oftentimes we have um, about, you know, appropriating those experiences or putting that into word. And how did you, uh, what was your guiding principle for the writing process in this, uh, in this collection? Yeah, and before we get there, I wanted to say that um, in studying women in the Holocaust, it was there was a tremendous amount of resistance to the study. And, and I thought it was so interesting that even the likes of Cynthia Ozick, who was probably the most famous writer on the Holocaust of women at the time, she was very resistant. And she said, the victims were not victims because they were men, women, or children. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be studied from that perspective. And it wasn't until uh, I think Raoul Hilberg said in 1992 that, that the annihilation was of all Jews, but the road to annihilation was marked by events that specifically affected men as men and women as women. And he kind of put a period on that. And I think henceforth, um, the, the, the topic and the, and the approach to studying the Holocaust took a turn. Um, as, for, as for writing about the Holocaust, it's very tricky. Um, it's a, a very sensitive. Um, I chose these women's memoirs and I, I tried to hone very closely to their words and, and to every detail of their writing. And it was really for me an experiment in empathy because these women wrote because they wanted their stories to be heard. And I felt that, that by writing in this way, I could breathe some fresh air into what their memory was, but it, it's a tricky, it's a, tri 
a tricky topic and, and I uh, really, my, my uh, intent was to honor their experience. Absolutely. And this takes us right into the first poem, which I, I find to be one of the most heartbreaking poems out of this whole collection that is titled Strollers of Auschwitz. And so, you know, this exercise of empathy, I think we will, as you go through the poems, we will definitely be able to, to see um, in, the, in the writing and in the way in which you, you know, touched on the subject. And so would you like to begin um, sure. reading the first one? Sure. So this, this poem was written in memory of Juliana Tedeschi and it's called Strollers of Auschwitz. Ordinary strollers, 10 rows of five on an outbound train, thick rubber wheels, dark awnings, curved push bars fixed as a still life, a rising swell of stretched canopies. What will the new mother notice? A broken spoke, elaborate cross stitching, knitted blankets folded back, my daughter's shadow. So in this first poem, um, Julia Tedeschi, as, as you mentioned, she was this Italian Jewish woman who was arrested in 1944 and deported to Auschwitz. And she has a very poignant witness account of this moment where the prisoner women were made to go and um, take care of the strollers, the empty strollers. So she was not the only woman that, that talked about this. Other women um, described that it. It was, very, it, was, it was a very moving scene on June 25th, 1944. And many women um, wrote, wrote about this, but, but Tedeschi with the most uh, expansive view. And what she talked about is that it was a Sunday morning and they came into the barrack and they woke up 50 women and started them on a march. And they thought certainly that they were going to the crematorium and they were marched past the, past the, the uh, crematorium to a place called Canada. And Canada is, is a series of maybe 30 warehouses where all the compass, when, when prisoners would come to Auschwitz, they would take everything from them. Of course, they thought, they didn't know that where they were going, but mm -hmm. all of their um, possessions were taken from them and stored there. And then these women were asked to, to walk these strollers for two miles to the train and then to line them up perfectly and send them back to Germany for the expectant mothers there. And it was, it, it was that scene and that image that really was the spark for this, for this project. It's incredibly powerful. And you know, if I may read this moment where we have a, an actual description coming from Julie, uh, Juliana Tedeschi, where she describes this moment and what I would like for us to, to really think about, and we, we already hear this coming through in the poem, but it is the question of the assault, the Nazi assault on motherhood. Uh, that becomes a very specific experience for women during the Holocaust. And Tedeschi writes about that day, she says that the strange procession moved forward. The mothers who had left children behind rested their hands on the push bar, instinctively feeling for the most natural position, promptly lifting the front wheels whenever they came to a bump. They saw gardens, avenues, rosy infants asleep in their carriages under vaporous pink and pale blue covers. The women who had lost children in the crematorium felt a physical longing to have a child at their breast while seeing nothing but a long plume of smoke that drifted away to infinity. Those who hadn't had children pushed their, pushed their carriages along clumsily and thought they would never have any and thanked God and all the empty baby carriages screeched, screeched, bounced, and banged into each other with the tired and desolate air of persecuted exiles. And so there's this, this incredible moment, and we see, you know, this juxtaposition in your poem, Jane, of the heaviness and the light, the concrete and the abstract. You describe the concrete things, the, the strollers, the thick rubber wheels, the broken spoke. And we're left with this image 
of the daughter's shadow, right? This, this, the, the, the smoke, the, the abstract. Uh, and it really evokes a powerful insight into the situation that is being described. Uh, we know that not only did the women, you know, survive experiences of violence and rape and humiliation and medical experiments, but the fact that their motherhood itself was under assault in this moment. Can you talk about the writing process um, of this specific poem for a moment? It was probably the most difficult to write because I wanted to keep it very narrow. Yeah. Um, it, it's such a big topic. I thought the most powerful way to bring it forward was to bring it most narrow in this image of a still life is really what came to me um, in all the, you know, metaphorically and, and, and very physically. Um, and I think it stands in great contrast with, with this next poem, which is full of life. So, Absolutely. I see that someone wrote here in the chat, uh, Gail Gary's asking, would Jane read the poem again, please? Would you mind reading it again, Jane, for a moment? Okay. Strollers of Auschwitz in memory of Juliana Tedeschi. Ordinary strollers. 10 rows of five on an outbound train, thick rubber wheels, dark awnings, curved push bars fixed as a still life, a rising swell of, of stretched canopies. What will the new mother notice? A broken spoke, elaborate cross stitching, knitted blankets folded back, my daughter's shadow. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Now, as we move to the second poem, Affidavit from America, uh, we're moving into a different uh, topic, uh, slightly different from the previous one that we just talked about. Uh, this poem, of course, is inspired by Ruth Moses Burns, who we will talk about once uh, you, you read the poem. Okay. Thank you. Affidavit from America in memory of Ruth Moses Burns. Nobody could imagine our life in Germany. And I was so young, 25 years old. I had hardly been married a year. My school friends switched sidewalks when they saw me. Were they afraid? Not of me, for themselves. And my uncle in America was slow to answer my letters. Was he concerned for me? No, for himself. But how could anyone imagine it, really? We had tickets on a southbound train from Berlin the night of Kristallnacht. On the platform, my husband extended a hand for me and the police officer grabbed his other one. I sat still beside my mother. My father too was arrested that night, sent east in a cattle car, six weeks in Buchenwald, together, the two of them. I had been raised with two maids and a cook. I studied five languages at school. After we lit Sabbath candles, we poured noodle soup from a silver tureen. My father was a grain merchant, my mother a pediatrician, no matter. When my uncle in Minneapolis delayed his reply to my letters, I did not find fault with him. How could I? I sent photographs of our wedding. I sealed my letters with a wax stamp, customary of that time. That time, I mean, before Hitler. But after 1933, oh, we felt it immediately. Transformed into outsiders in our motherland. We fought for exit visas, all of us. But you need an affidavit, you know. Someone abroad to vouch for your character, your work ethic. Not to become a burden in your new country, a burden. Extermination camps awaited our arrival. But my uncle in America hesitated. When his letter finally arrived, I collapsed at the post office, bewildered by his nonchalance. 
but I was a well-bred German. At Ellis Island, I kissed his cheek and handed him chocolates. We never once spoke of what might have been. Thank you, Jane. This is an incredibly moving poem. Um, and, you know, as, as you read it, and every time I read it, 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 it really takes us into that moment, that historical moment that, uh, you know, most of us are so familiar with reading about. And as we know, especially Chris, after Kristallnacht, which is the moment when Ruth uh, Moses Burns actually, you know, is able to leave and come to the United States. Uh, that in that year, 1938, about 36,000 Jews had emigrated from Germany. The following year, 77,000 German Jews had emigrated from Germany. But in the case of Ruth uh, Moses Burns, what we have is this incredible description of the desperation to get away. And so I, what I wanted to ask you, Jane, is to talk about, you know, because you, you brilliantly balanced this desperation to get away as well there is this guilt that we hear also coming through uh, between the lines, especially towards the end. Would you talk a little bit about this, balancing these two things? Yeah, what, what fascinated me about this woman, and, and by the way, I found, I, I researched her on the uh, University of Southern California Shoah Foundation visual archive. So as I, I was able to, to watch her interview, and she, you know, she was perfectly coiffed and she had pale pink lipstick and gold clip-on earrings and a powdered face. And she was just totally put together as an 83-year-old. And you felt this well of emotion under the surface that she still was unwilling to share. And uh, that's what I was, this, this pent up anguish is what I was trying to get at with this poem. She, she said in the interview, she never, talk to her children about her experience until they were much older. And when, uh, when the uh, interviewer asked her, why do you think you survived the war? She said, because we were lucky to get an affidavit in time. Absolutely, and, it, and it's, it's heartbreaking um, because we see in, in throughout the course of the semester when we study the different women and how they reacted, of course, you know, we have uh, the two spectrums, those who never wanted to talk to their children at all about what had happened and those who talked very frequently to their children about what had happened. And in the case of Ruth, we know that she waited until they were so much older. And it really is after that moment in 1996 when she gives the interview to the Shoah Foundation that I think we start to see her trying to to work out the past, but yeah, you know, but she, didn't. But she, <laughs> <laughs> she said she didn't want to burden anyone with her story. Exactly, exactly. And you know, for those who are lucky enough to get away, and I think that that's what we see coming through both her testimony, as well as, as the way that you that you portray it in this poem specifically, is that for those who are lucky enough to get away and cross the ocean, to watch the unfolding of the war, the unfolding of the Holocaust, the, the immense psychological and emotional suffering that they bore, um, you know, created this very strong sense of survivor's guilt uh, that we see uh, coming through yeah. in her experience. And so this is a, a, an incredible uh, description of that moment. And, you know, the moment that she comes to America, as you say, uh, I collapsed at the postal office, bewildered by his nonchalance, but I was a well-bred German. So here we still have, you know, this is the moment um, when for most German Jews, as we know, uh, at the time that they identified as being Germans. You know, it's after the Nuremberg laws um, that, that Jews are forced into this category of, of becoming, you know, the, the Nazi system creates this category where they have to now be different and separate from their society that they had known and, and been a part of for many generations. And so in her case, we see that she really holds this still. Yes, still. Um, at an 80, as an 83 year old, she did absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's an incredible description of that moment for those who are able to get away, but at what cost um, later on. So absolutely incredible. Now, 
when teaching about a course about women in the Holocaust, it's not, of course, only important for us to talk about the many experiences as we did uh, in my course, but I was very conscious about the fact that uh, there is a need to diversify the curriculum and the types of stories that we focus and teach about or that the students learn about. And so for this, I actually really wanted to also include the Sephardic voices in 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 our approach to the topic and so i turned to an incredibly important volume that has been recently published um, that is titled sephardi lives a documentary history from 1700 to 1950 and in this volume edited by julia phillips cohen and sarah abravai stein we learn about the experiences of sephardic women that have often been missing from the larger conversation about women's experiences in the Holocaust. And in these accounts, we have the stories of women coming from Turkey, Bulgaria, uh, Greece, Yugoslavia. Um, and there is one that really stands out, uh, which is the story of Jamila Kolonomos. And so in this next poem, uh, Tobacco Kiosk, uh, we will hear the story or we'll hear the poem that is inspired by this story, and then we'll talk about Jamila. So this, this poem is called A Tobacco Kiosk in Macedonia, and it's written in memory of Jamila Kolonomos. I'm not talking about how we marched in the mountains, we partisans, our road battles, our feats. It's all in the books how we shouldered through night lizards, dizzy from hunger, hallucinating, levitating, leaving bodies of friends in the forest. The roundups too, you can learn about those in your library stacks. I returned to Monastir after the war, Judenfrei. I bartered my mother's dresses for black bread and marmalade. A neighbor's daughter pranced by in my blue embroidered blouse. Never mind, I know you've read plenty. Now close your pages, shelve your knowledge, lower your gaze. I was locked in a kiosk the night they emptied the ghetto. The one-legged merchant drew a curtain, bolted us in. Estella and I, we grabbed each other's elbows. We quivered like mice in the dirt. It was midnight when we first heard horse hoofs, horns blasting, carts creaking. And by dawn, the swell of groans, wails that muffled the prayers of hundreds, thousands, countless kin. Jamila, my father howled, his yell cutting through. But the kiosk was locked and I stayed safe among the cigarettes. For a month I huddled there, hardly breathing. Yes, I fought mightily in the mountains. But where was my courage when my father called? How do I speak to you of shame? Thank you, Jane. You know, this is that, that last, the last two lines, you know, I fought mightily in the mountains, but where was my courage when my father called? So once again, we see this, 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 you know, sense of shame and, and sense of just the desperation of the situation at the moment. And what is so fascinating about this poem is that you begin with a narrative that I think is familiar to most of us, the, that, that, the, the narrative of the, of the partisan fighters. So here we have this example of this Macedonian young Jewish girl who, who, who joins the partisans and fights in the mountains. Um, but once the war is over and she returns to her city monastery where 98% of the Jewish population was murdered in concentration camps. There's barely anyone left. There's barely anyone to return to. And, and so would you talk to us about the, the inspiration for this poem? Talk a little bit more about you know, uh, Jamila's story that, that really compelled you to write this poem, as well as 
you begin with the fight and then you really bring us into this very specific moment, which I think is incredibly um, important for us to talk about. Yeah, well, Jamila is an amazing human being. I mean, she, uh, in, the, in the Yugoslav resistance, she, she rose to the rank of commissar and, and she got several national merits for her, her resistance work. She went on and got a PhD in Ladino and became a professor of romantic languages. And when Yugoslavia sent a, uh, a delegation to China to, to visit Mao Zedong, she was among she was among the delegation. I mean, she was very, very well educated, very decorated, very, um, very prestigious in, in Yugoslav society. And yet she was, could this, this moment of her, I don't know what word, I, I use the word shame. I don't know what word, she, she, she never got over that moment of hearing her family get, get get carried away. They all went to Treblinka and they were all killed upon arrival. So there, there was no one left for her. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have this, sorry, Jean, go ahead. No, I, I just, the other image that like, like the strollers at Auschwitz, she describes uh, going back to Monastir, everyone, everyone she knew is gone. Her family's gone. And she sees a young girl wearing one of her blouses. Yes. Um, yeah, that's what I was going another to mention. That, that could be another still life rather than a, than a story. That Ab was... Absolutely. And in this case, and that was the question that I was going to ask because of this line that you have in the second stanza where, it says, where you write, um, the roundups too, you can learn about those in the library stacks. I returned to monastery after the war, Judenfrei. I bartered my mother's dresses for black bread and marmalade a neighbor's daughter pranced by in my blue embroidered blouse. And we have, you know, in this documentary history, we actually have her firsthand account where she's telling to, the, to a newspaper, actually. Um, this is published right after um, the liberation of the camp. She gives this interview to a Greek newspaper where she's telling these stories. Um, and she talks about how her mother had a, a beautiful dress made for her uh, for Pesach, the last Pesach that the family had together. And she held on to this dress until the very last moment. But in that moment where she was, she had nothing else to, to live by. She had no money. She had to sell this dress. And it is already bringing us to this moment of the aftermath. What happened to those who survived? Um, the destruction. And as Jane said, this kind of guilt or shame or has the hesitation uh, to, to even, you know, broach the topic because there was no one left. And not only that, those who were the neighbors had literally taken the dress and she has to confront this new reality of seeing this woman walking, you know, with her embroidered a blouse, and then she sees someone with her mother's black dress. And so this is an incredibly uh, moving moment because we oftentimes when we hear the stories of the partisans, um, the narrative of the very heroic deeds, which indeed they were. But here in this case too, we see that it is in that moment of the fact that she together with other young women were hid uh, in this cigarette kiosk, their lives were saved. Um, but then she had to live with this memory, this haunting memory of hearing her father uh, call her name and not being able to, to respond or to go for him. And so this is incredibly, um, you know, the way in which you describe it, Jane, I think really brings us to that very specific experience of women that if we didn't have her account, we would only know of her partisan right. um, her decoratedness, which is mighty. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely incredible. Now, when we think about resistance, as I'm already alluding to, oftentimes we think about the really big acts of heroism, but there are other ways in which uh, we, we find these moments of resistance that the women uh, in the ghettos, in the concentration camps, in the extermination camps, that they developed the mechanisms of resistance for themselves, amongst themselves. And this next poem that Jane will read uh, show us just that. 
So this, this poem was written in memory of Ruth Kluger and it's called Cooking With Our Tongues. I remember I sighed into our barracks putrid air, recalling Vienna where I sparked stovetop flames with my nimble fingers. Remember butter loud enough this time to stir a creek in the bunk below me, a twitch at the corner of my mouth. Butter, someone quips from the far side of the room. Then across the aisle, chicken soup with rice. Behind me, honey cake with raisins. Above me, raisins, glinces. Round challah for the new year. Chopped herring, stuffed cabbage, sweet cream, egg noodles, poppy seeds. Thick chicken fat cooling near the curtains. Incredible. I mean, this poem is just so rich with the images and the sounds. We can almost smell as you're reading through the poem. It really is such a, an incredibly powerful poem in the sense that it is describing this other form of resistance, which is the women's sharing of recipes when they were in the camps. So even if they didn't have food, there was this practice where they began to do this kind of food talk. Would you talk a little bit to us about this, Jane? It's fascinating. I wrote this poem in mem memory of Ruth Kluger because she died in October yes. of 22 as I was doing this. But there were many, many women who wrote about sharing recipes in their barracks in the concentration camps. It was, and they knew it was an act of resistance. And they, they would get into arguments. Do you let the water boil or do you bring it to a slow simmer? Do you, I'm not a cook, <laughs> but they have all these, you know, do you do this, do you do that? And, and uh, they would argue about their recipes. And there, there's a wonderful article called Food Talk, Gendered Responses to Hunger in the Concentration Camps. And it, and it goes through how these, I mean, it, even in some of the camps, they made cookbooks and it was their way of just keeping at it, remembering family gatherings. And I thought it was so interesting because um, Ellie Wiesel and Primo Levi, Victor. Uh, Clamper. Frankel, Frankel. Oh, Frankel. Uh, they all talked about hunger. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, I, I don't think, the camp experience goes without recognition of starvation and hunger. Absolutely. But these women talked about food and recipes and it kept them going. And it, I just, I just, I just love that. I, I just could imagine myself being there with these women. Absolutely. And, you know, I think what I really like about this poem as well, you have another one in the collection and maybe in the Q&A we can get into, uh, you can talk a little bit about the other poems in this collection that we don't get to hear today. But, you know, the communal experience of food, of, you know, whether it was actual food in the soup uh, kitchens or in this moment of remembering and sharing with one another that really created a, a communal sense of survivorship amongst these women. I mean, a lot of the testimonies that we read uh, that de dealt with this question of the food talk and the sharing of these, of, of these recipes, many women actually said that this was the one thing that really helped them to resist in that situation. They really saw you know, what we would think as a, simply a moment of sharing with one another, but they really, um, you know, give credit to this as being a life-saving mechanism. Yeah, a survival of, mechanism, absolutely. That, that they develop. And we, you know, we also have other cases of women who were sharing poems and songs, some who were having classes, language classes and teaching one another. And it created also the sense of family because for a lot of these women, they had lost their children, they had lost their parents um, and they were alone. And so also these relationships where, you know, women in their forties were teaching, you know, the, the younger women in their twenties food, you know, so that they would know how to cook one day in the future. So that future oriented mm -hmm. um, 
mechanism of resistance really is something that is so powerful for us to keep in mind and change our perspective of how do we actually understand resistance and so in this moment yeah. of yes go ahead yeah, I, I would just say one more thing just specifically about ruth kluger because um she came she came to the united states in 47 and, and earned a phd at berkeley in literature and, and taught at princeton and i mean these women <laughs> <laughs> are in each and each one of them had incredible lives and and um i think that gets so lost in this in this mix um and that's why what i was really looking to do in these poems is make them very small very focused and very personal because their lives were so rich and, and, you know, you can only, you know, just, just on the other side of it, imagine the women who perished and what their lives were and could have been. Um, Absolutely. And, and I think that's what haunts me mm -hmm. um, in writing these. And, and, and specifically, we'll get to that in this next poem, I think. Absolutely. That's what I was about to say that, you know, this idea of, you know, the haunting memory of that experience is something that Charlotte Delbo, who perhaps I think is one of the more well-known names out of the uh, you know the whole collection, I think most people will perhaps be familiar with Charlotte Delbo um, as she published you know her trilogy. Um, she wrote it as soon as the war was over, as soon as liberation happened, but then she stuffed it in a in a in a drawer for the next twenty years, um, and then she finally published her account dealing with this question of having survived but never really leaving Auschwitz or Auschwitz always being with her. And so in this next poem, uh, it is bringing us to the moment of liberation. And so um, here we have the last poem that we'll be talking about, which is um, April 23rd, 1945. Yeah. So this poem, as you said, is written in memory of Charlotte Del Beau called April 23rd, 1945. The most handsome man we had ever seen appears at the gate and pulls a drag on his cigarette. He stands apart from the Gestapo, huddled nearby in trench coats and fedoras. We look at the man and he looks at us. Rows of heads, we walk together in the dark towards the entrance that would be our exit but we do not know this. The man looks at our faces, ignores our shrunken bodies and swollen feet. He must doubt that we are real, but he does not look away. Are you the French, he asks us? The trench coats and fedoras turn their backs. The man wears a white armband with a red cross on one arm, a blue one with a yellow cross on the other. French, he pulls another drag and holds in the smoke, though his cheek continues to twitch. Now, we are going to Sweden, he says. We gaze back at him with blank faces. Then slowly we move through the gate. The flowers, the air, his human voice, children that run through the train station. So we French women left Robinsbrook that night. I came back from another world to this one. I brush my teeth in the mornings now, put on lipstick and work in an office, yet I seldom talk to others. Memory returns me to the threshold of that gate, and I no longer distinguish between this world and that. Thank you, Jane. Again, here we have another one of these women, Charlotte Delbo, who at the time when the Nazis occupied France, she was actually abroad. She was far away in South America. And 
rather than staying there in the safety of distance, she chose to return to Europe and to join uh, the resistance, which is how she gets deported to Auschwitz. She goes through a few camps as well as Ravensbrück, as Jane mentioned. And this poem specifically brings us to that moment of liberation that is oftentimes very difficult for survivors to grapple with because on the one hand, there is this moment where there's freedom, they're, they're being liberated from the situation. But on the other hand, it is also the moment where this new process begins of understanding what has just happened and what it lays ahead of them in this moment where now they have to face a world without their families, without their communities that have been murdered by the Nazis. And in this poem, Jane, there is really this thin line between belief and disbelief, right? There's this kind of juxtaposition of the prisoners who have been reduced to shrunken bodies and the handsome man with a human voice. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, um, you know, the, 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 the devices that you used for this poem and the creation of this poem, because you really create the atmosphere for us here. Do you want to talk a little bit about the process of writing this poem? Yeah. Um, Charlotte Del Beau was an incredibly sensitive writer. Um, and like you said, she began writing immediately after the war and very impressionistic. And then she put it away. She couldn't publish it and she didn't publish it until much later. But one of the things that, that she dwelt on and, and worked, and you can feel her grinding away at it, she talked about the difference between deep memory, that is the physical memory of being in the camps, and external memory, which is the intellectual memory of being in the camp. And that, she said, are the words, the words she uses. She says, the words I use don't describe what happened to me. And, and she really, she she really worked on this. I mean, you, you can feel her grinding away at it. It's, it's quite beautiful, but it's, it's very disturbing. And so in this, I, I really wanted to get at that sense of these blank human beings whose memory is just deep in their marrow. Um, and then, you know, you can describe the, the flowers they saw, you know, describe what you want, but, but the memory is, is in their bones and doesn't leave them. Absolutely, and she, she talks about this idea of thirst as well, which is something that, um, you know, here you have the line about, she learns how to brush her teeth again in the morning. She's putting on the lipstick, getting ready for work. And this is an idea that when we discussed about Charlotte Delbo and her writings, that she talks about that kind of, gap that seems to exist from that anti-world of Auschwitz and the world in which now she is living, where she gets to brush her teeth, where she gets to put on lipstick. And she also talks about this idea of, of thirst um, and having this deep memory, physical memory of thirst. And she says, of course, today I also feel thirst and then I have a cup of tea. Um, and then she says, this word has also been split into two. So this idea of the memory how is it that the survivor is able to mediate what happened to this new life that seems to be completely disconnected? And she says, thirst has turned back into a word for common use. But if I dream of the thirst I suffered in Birkenau, I once again see the person I was, haggard, halfway crazed, near to collapsed. I physically feel the real thirst, and it is an atrocious nightmare. This is why I say today that while knowing perfectly well that it corresponds to the fact, it corresponds to the facts, I no longer know if it is real. Yeah. And I think we also see this coming through uh, in the poem, this idea that the memory returns and she's no longer able to distinguish. As in much as she wanted to leave it behind, she couldn't. Absolutely, absolutely. And others only left it behind. It's, it's Needless to say, it's complex and, and everyone's experience was different. And again, that's particular, particular, particular narrow. Was, was Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, these poems really force us to think about how the war looks when we include women's narratives um, in describing what occurred. Um, I want to thank Jane for creating this really thought provoking collection, you know, I hope I wish we had more time and that everybody could read the rest of the poems. Uh, 
and really this is an incredible work in honoring the lives of these women and in this original exploration of, of gender Jane has really honored the particularities of differences which I think is really important in adding to our knowledge of the Holocaust and so um, I just want to thank once again Jane for this creative collection that has been so carefully crafted it has it's really inspiring and it also informs us um, about the real life experiences of the women that were here featured. So thank you, Jane. I think we have some time for a Q&A if anybody would like to ask questions. We have a few moments for that. And I would like to, uh, let's see here. We do have a few questions coming in. So for the first question, Jane, um, can you talk about how you decided to approach your project for the class through poetry. Yeah, I, I go back to the, the that image of the strollers. I, 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 it was early in the semester. We read this. We read this um, little excerpt from from Tedeschi's memoir, and it, I couldn't get it out of my head. I had never heard of that incident. I heard a lot of incidents, a lot of grueling incidents, but this was so delicate and so, and, and it, it had brought back, you know, why didn't, you know, why did they choose women for this task? Mm -hmm. um, men could have done it and, and they could have taken, they didn't need to be one-on-one -on -one with a stroller. They could have shipped the whole, the whole. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was so torturous. And the way she described it was so torturous. And I, and, and I thought the only way to get at this is through something that's poetic. I, it, there's, there's no other way to get to what that image holds in it. And so that, that was the beginning of it. And I might add as well that uh, for this class, usually, you know, the final paper usually is the, it's, it's a final scholarly paper. So what Jane actually also did for this collection, not only do we have the poem, but she has a bibliographical, um, um, page for each one of the women where she uh, really anchors um, her inspiration in the texts, in the scholarly publications that we were dealing with in class. So it is, you know, part of a poetry collection, but also an incredible insight into the lives of these women, which um, I hope that Jane will continue to develop. I mean, it's really fantastic when you actually read the poem together with the biography, it really enriches that experience as well. Let's see, we have lots of questions coming in. All right, we have a question here, Jane. How may we read the whole collection? Is, <laughs> is <Holly>. Jane <laughs> publishing her poems? When is the publication coming out, Jane? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, stay tuned. I don't know, but call me and I'll read you the other poems. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to uh, Jane or to me. You can all email us. I'm sure we would be happy to um, answer any you know specific questions. All right, we have um, yeah. See, we have another um, comment here by Kathy saying this was so moving. Would love to have an opportunity to read the whole collection. Uh, can you also share the names and books you mentioned so we can read them? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, it probably is easier <laughs> I mean, if if I just pull up the syllabus, I can actually share this or if any, there's a way that we can send out an email later to the, yes, via email. So um, what we can do is share our emails and then we can exchange. I think that would be a little bit easier. Yeah, because a lot of the memoirs aren't actually in the, the syllabus, mm -hmm. but, but I mean, the main one you can Google and find the memoirs. Absolutely. I mean, the main one that I would recommend uh, is the different voices, which is the book that I mentioned that was published in 1993, edited by John Roth and Carol Rittner. This is one that we have um, quite a few of the voices. And then of course, the other one that I mentioned, as far as what we just mentioned today during our talk, um, Sephardi Lives, a documentary history um, from 1700 to 1950. So these are the two 
ones that we are really talking about, but there are many others for those who are interested. Okay, let's see a few more questions here. Tara says, Jane, thank you for your work. I would also like to read the collection, powerful work. <laughs> uh, Janice says, cousin Jane, I'm very honored to hear your poetry. I will never look at a stroller the same way. Oh, mm. goodness. All poems were such visuals, well done. I would love to hear the whole collection. Everyone is you know, thanking you and the poetry is amazing. Um, all right, and Jay, uh, Annie is sharing the link. So if, if there are any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. There is, while we wait, I would like to ask uh, maybe one more question, Jane, about, we noticed that in a few of the poems, uh, there is the change to the first person voice. Would you talk about, you know, in the beginning of our session, we talked about sometimes there is this almost hesitancy, right? This idea of writing about the lives of others, especially in topics such as this. Can you talk about your decision to, to use the first person voice in the poem? Well, that there's the tension. That, that was really the tension. Um, I felt it, you know, it's obviously the most intimate. It's the most uh, personal. It's about the way I could get small, 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 and as empathetic as I possibly could. But it's risky again, because it was not my experience. So I, I, I struggled with that, but I felt it was the best way to express what I was trying to express. And I did it with, uh, with, with the utmost honor to these women. You absolutely did. And, you know, if we don't have any more questions, I would like to conclude by actually talking about uh, cooking with our tongues, which is not a poem that you read here today. But I think it's also another one of these poems that we touched on this topic a little bit. Um, and you wrote it in honor of Rachel Auerbach. Oh, the, uh, the worst I get in the year. The, 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 soup, the yeah. soup kitchen, I'm sorry. Kitchen, I, yeah. Yes. And in that poem, you know, if we want to maybe just, would you like to read that one as we conclude? Yeah, Jane? let me find it. Hold on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as you're finding this, I would like to conclude with this because um, Emmanuel Rigonblum, who I think is, you know, a very familiar name and in, in most uh, have probably heard about Emmanuel Rigonblum and his work with the Onyx Shabbos group at the Warsaw Ghetto, which was this incredible group of scholars and historians and writers who were writing the history of what was happening at the Warsaw Ghetto because they said, we are Jews, we will write our own history. We don't want the Nazi history to tell our history. And so they went to great efforts to write their own history. And Emmanuel Rigonblum writes in this time that, quote, the story of the Jewish woman will be a glorious page in the history of Jewry during the present war. And Rachel Auerbach, who was very much involved with this group as well, is part of this of this history. So I would like for us to conclude on this note, please. Yeah, and whoever asked the question about these, this is the woman that I would look up. She is in, she survived the war and I'm gonna shut up, but she survived the war and afterwards was able to, to bring a delegation to dig up the, the milk cans where these notes were kept and it, and it is the documentation of the Warsaw Ghetto. So this, this poem is called Soup Kitchen in the Warsaw Ghetto in memory of Rachel Arbach. Onion fumes infuse, obscure my vision like a bride's veil. Chopping on my wooden block, I seal my eyes, drip from, 70, from 40 Lenzo over these ghetto walls to Warsaw proper, where I once studied Spinoza, wrote for Yiddish journals, teased my poet lover, where I simmered onions with cracked pepper and parsley at the evening's open window, humming the workers' promise, dreaming, always dreaming of the paradise that we will build. Now I murmur crypt encrypted code, smuggle rotten turnips, falsify papers. I lift withered mothers from stairwells, console their newly orphaned. Slicing my knife through these bitter layers of loss, I stir the translucent past into opaque tomorrow. It is certain I have not saved a single life. 
I spit into my kerchief. I force my hair into a bun. Now I ladle steaming soup into another broken bowl. Thank you, Jane. And thank you all for being here with us uh, this afternoon. I would like to turn it back over to Annie. Thank you so much to both Jane and Sarah for being with us today, Jane, for sharing this amazing work you've done in such a creative way to approach the topic and to, to hear about it a little differently than, than maybe we usually do. Um, Sarah, for your brilliant moderating skills, we appreciate it. Um, what I'd like to do, and I'll, I'll ask Jane and Sarah if, if they're okay with this, if, if you all would like to send me some of your um, sort of top resources, Jane, maybe a couple of favorite works you used for your research, um, I'd be happy to send that in an email to everyone who attended today. So that way you have a, a record of it that way and you don't have to keep it all in your, in your head. Um, so we'll, we'll do that. I appreciate it. But again, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, well, thank you, you all guys. for joining us today. Um, we hope to see you at our next program, dhhrm.org for all of our upcoming programs and events. Everyone have a great Bye, rest everybody. of your day. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.